All right, our next speaker is Laszlo Barini. Uh, he is the founder and president of Barini Associates, Inc. Uh, in 1989, Mr. Barini founded Barini Associates. While at Barini Associates, Mr. Barini served as global trading strategist for Deutsche Bank Securities from 1998 to 2002. His views and opinions are frequently featured in the Wall Street Journal, Barron's, uh, and Business Week. He is a former Forbes columnist, a panelist on Wall Street Week with Louis Rukeyser, and a frequent guest on CNBC and Bloomberg. I think the first time I saw him was on Louis Rukeyser's show. Um, in 1999, Mr. Bernie in, was inducted into the Wall Street Hall of Fame, and in 2004, he was named one of Smart Money's Power 30 Market Movers. We are honored to have him today. Please give a warm welcome to Laszlo Bernie. Good morning. Uh, we have a presentation here, and if you go to Barini.com, you'll be able to download it, plus a lot of other charts and interesting items that we've put together for your use. About a year or so ago, I met a gentleman who was very successful in the art world and also a very successful investor. And he said, you know, I've been reading your stuff. And I can't really figure you out. Are you an economist? Are you a statistician? What exactly are you? And I said, I'm a trader. He said, Hmm, that makes some sense. Many years ago, I started off in Wall Street sitting on a trading desk. And by looking at the market and reading a lot of things and uh, studying, I came up with some investment ideas, uh, one of the first of which was the trading calendar. Until 1974, we didn't know when Xerox reported earnings. We didn't know when the government reported various economic indicators. And it dawned on me at one point that they came out at sort of regular intervals. So I introduced an idea of putting it all on one sheet. And that was the beginning of a lot of ideas which drew the attention of the trading community. And suggested to me by some friends that I should look to a, more of a trading firm. And Solomon Brothers' name came up. At that time, Solomon Brothers was considered well, Merrill Lynch was considered the biggest firm on Wall Street. Goldman Sachs was the best managed, and Solomon was the most feared. And a friend of mine set up a meeting with me and the head trader at Solomon Brothers, a gentleman named Michael Bloomberg. And after about two cups of coffee, Michael offered me a job. And I said, Michael, yeah, I know you don't want me to call accounts anymore. I know you don't want me to trade. What exactly am I going to do? He says, you're going to find out what's broken and fix it and make what works better. So we came up with a bunch of ideas, and 15 years later, Michael called me again and said, the new system we're working on is doing very well. Bond traders really appreciate what we're doing. But every time we go to the stock people, they say, what we really want is Laszlo's stuff. Well, what is Laszlo's stuff? It's basically this approach that takes three, th three elements, one of which is data, secondly is, strategy, is uh, analysis, and then strategy. But isn't that what everybody does? And truthfully, it's not quite true. Uh, we find that one of the great opportunities we have is data. So well, which button do I hear? Hit Q. I, uh, the green one. Green one? Yeah, just the big one. Did that move? Yeah. There you go. OK. <laughs> you might be surprised that one of our clients for a long time was Dow Jones. Dow Jones was a client of ours. <laughs> Why? They called us because they wanted information on the Dow Jones Industrial Average. They knew that over the years I had collected better and more data on the Dow than they had. To give you just one example, according to the Dow's official records, it first, the index first traded above 1,000 in 1966. It didn't. We went to the library and got the newspapers for the next day, and there was no mention of it. In fact, the Dow never crossed 1,000. It was on 1972. I would point it was on the front page of the New York Times. And two days later, it closed above there for the first time. So even something as simple as the Dow Jones has holes in it. The second element, uh, the second thing we do in terms of data is somewhat unique. We call this anecdotal data. Every day I go through the newspapers, magazines, uh, transcripts, and we take the major and important news stories, and we actually put them in the computer. 
And we have a database going back to 1962 of major news stories. And from this, and this incident, incidentally, um, is something that we find not only very useful in understanding the market, but it's very useful in analysis. Because from this, we can get some very interesting charts. Um, if you go back to the beginning of the bull market, the technical community was not really excited about the bull market in 2009. Uh, it didn't have volume, the wrong group for uh, acting up. Uh, we, we were due for a correction. So we were able to draw charts like this. And so knowing how technicians felt, on April 26, when they came out and said bye, I said, oh, no. You know, eight markets up 80 percent, and now it's safe to go in the water. And need I tell you that when they were telling us to buy, we were two days in to a 15 percent correction. At the absolute bottom, in the middle of in July 4th of 2000, as the S&P was getting to 1,000, the technician said sell. So we can talk about technical analysis. Uh, but I can assure you that if I went to Michael Bloomberg and told him Atlantic Ridgefield was about to have a double bottom or something, what Michael would have said would not have been very polite. From this, we can also look at the various individuals in the community. This happens to be a chart of one individual's comments during the course of the bull market. I think he's called for about five, 20 percent corrections and at least two crashes. This is an idea that came to us from Joe Granville, of all people. And we do this on all of the major commentators. And not only does it give us a much better sense of the sentiment, it also saves a lot of time. Because there's a lot of people that we don't listen to because we have their record. And I think one of the most valuable things you can do as an individual investor is keep these kind of, keep the newspapers, keep the major news stories, and go back. And I tell people at the end of the year, don't read the end of the year stories. Make a pile of magazines, and sometime on the first nice day in the spring, or a really cold day in March, then read them, and you find you really probably didn't miss very much. Uh, we do a lot of studies, analysis. Um, also, one thing, be a little bit skeptical. This top chart came from a major Wall Street economist, and he said, if you can read it, you can see at the bottom, this indicator has a perfect record in predicting recessions. Well, it's not really perfect. There's actually about five other times when uh, it's given a signal. Is that showing? They're up on it. Okay. It's just hard to see from our perspective. Right. It's called for about five re recessions, which never happened. One of the things we find very helpful is to, again, gather data, look at it, and analyze it. One example of this is we not only look at indicators, we ask ourselves, where do they come from? How valid are they? Because they stand tests. The American Association of Individual Investors puts out this top chart every, every uh, week, and we've never been able to find of any value. There's no correlation, has very little indicative value, so we turned upside down. And that didn't work either. And I can't tell you how many things we look at, but we just ask ourselves, in a trading context where we've got to make decisions all the time, how useful are these things? One of the disappointments we find is that people really don't do analysis. As far back as June 2009, uh, Forbes ran this graph, which has been run almost every week since then. It shows the uh, capital adjusted price earnings ratio, usually attributed to Robert Schiller. It's actually from Graham and Dodd 100 years ago. Uh, and everybody keeps talking about the fact that it's overvalued, it's really overvalued. Now it's extremely overvalued. Well, and one of the great proponents of this is it's supposed to smooth out the earnings. And it disappoints me that all these people talking about it for six years no one's ever tried to explain to you why it's a better mousetrap. So we ran the bottom graph. And as you see, at times, it actually makes things look worse than they really are. And for six years, this has been a yellow light telling you to be really cautious about the market. It's never told you to buy, which to me is a really critical issue. Something that tells me to sell, anybody who tells me to sell, first of all, I want to know when they tell me to buy. So we're not as concerned about a lot of things as, as some people are. Of all the studies we've done, 
The most important one was a study of sector movement, of group rotation and the like. For years, I was intrigued by the whole idea of what, how does the bull market take place, what groups do you buy when, uh, what is group rotation, when after energy, what do I buy? So we sat down about 10 years ago and did a, you know, about a one-year study, probably cost half a million dollars. It's the most complete and most in-depth study ever done of group movements in the market. I can say that with some assurance because we wouldn't have done it if we could have borrowed it or even stole it, but we couldn't. We, everything we found was anecdotal. Just to give you an idea of the, of the caution, the top, the, top, the yellow, the chart with all the, the greens and the reds is the technology in the various bull markets. And you see the green is very strong. So in some bull markets, technology is very strong for a long time. In some bull markets, technology has 20% corrections. And the yellow and the little white dots is where technology peaked. So in some bull markets, technology does very well early. Some bull markets, technology does very well late. So the whole idea of there's some sort of consistent pattern. And I think that one of the things that, we always, that we've suggested throughout this whole bull market is this is not a normal market. This is not a typical, this is not an average. You cannot, you, 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 we have people are going, I think, going astray by trying to put it into some sort of parameters. What we determined in 2009 was this was going to be an extraordinary bull market for the simple reason that financials were leading. When you have a market where financials are the strongest sector in the first three months, in the first three months of this bull market, they doubled. Those bull markets will be protracted and long. We've just written a piece called When Will the Fat Lady Sing? And as we look at it, we still have some time to go. So that takes care of two elements of that we work on, data and, strat and analysis. What about strategy? Our strategy, again, as a trader, first of all, we avoid commentary. Ideas like the market could have a 10% correction, that you know, such and such is topping out, they don't work on a trading desk. At Solomon Brothers, we had two pads. We had a buy pad and we had a sell pad. And there was no maybe, could, whatever. The ideas such as 42% of stocks or you know, a new high or whatever, they don't really translate into a trading desk. So we try to avoid commentary. The second thing that we do a lot of is looking at the market itself. And this is where I think a lot of portfolio managers today have lost their way. The market is not really part of the process anymore. We don't really look at the ticker tape. For years, we used to read the ticker tape. We still do, but it's harder to with high frequency trading. And the chart on the bottom is a chart showing money flow in a stock. At the end of 19... In 96, I was on the year-end Wall Street show. I think we were up 50 or 60% that year. So Lou Rukeyser turned to me and says, well, for the next year, what is your stock picks? I said, my first stock pick is Apple Computer. And this was Apple Computer. The stock was going down, but all the big money was going into Apple Computer. And people said to me, what do you know about Apple Computer? I said, I don't know anything about Apple Computer. But the market does. And this is probably one of the greatest calls you'll ever see. According to Bloomberg's uh, database, at the end of 1996, it was $0.46. Cents. And we, for years, people congratulated me, or they came up to me and said, I wish I would have listened to you. So we still pay a lot of attention to the market. And through all the idea, all the commentary about uh, QE2 and whatever, we kept saying, well, if housing isn't such a, if QE2 is a problem and it's going to translate into housing, why is Sherwin Williams and Whirlpool hitting new highs? Why is a stock like NVR, which is a housing stock, trading at $1,000 a share and not being sold down? And for people who wanted to, who were negative, I said, go short NVR. You'll get over it real quickly. The third thing that uh, we find we, that we use in our strategy is discipline. Our newsletter last year, we put out, we put out in the newsletter, we have two portfolios. We have a conservative and we have a growth. The conservative portfolio last year was up 23%. Now, we only have 10 stocks in it, so everybody, it's not an unmanageable amount. And while 23% was nice, 
What we were really proud about was we had a discipline. We stayed with the names. We didn't have big drawdowns. When the, when the stock wave, when market wavered, we didn't have a whole lot of issues. So we find that uh, this, the, the big, one of the big concerns I find about individuals is they don't have enough of a discipline. I don't speak in the public very much anymore for a variety of reasons, one of which is that people really don't listen. People, to me, too many individual investors think of this of a portfolio as a salad bar, an idea here, an idea there, and they're sort of all over the place. The other thing that we find, I find important that I can't emphasize, emphasize enough is you have to work hard. I've been doing this 40 years. I work harder now than I ever did before. There's more things to worry about, there's more newspapers, and we generally, as a rule of thumb, avoid the blogs, the websites, and the ideas that are so readily available. And the last thing that we do, I think is very important, is it always strikes people as sort of funny. Do something physical. You know, what somebody once wrote I me and told me they, had a, they disagree with some of my views, but one of the things they did was they kept their own records by hand. And just by plotting things every single day, they got a sense of the market. And because I go through so many newspapers and magazines and read them with some real consciousness, I don't read the Wall Street Journal with the same mindset I read the source pages. I read the journal looking for ideas. What are people thinking? What are they saying? And I find that doing something physical really uh, makes you better. So <laughs> we think the market's still doing better. We look for uh, higher prices. Uh, I think the most critical issue is uh, somebody once said, the critical issue in stock market is not the economic cycle, it's the psychological cycle. And when I read and I look in the paper and I see 12 reasons why the market will crash next year and 15 reasons to get the market today, that tells me the market's still alive and well and uh, we think it has more to go. Thank you very much.